Okay. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, I'll go ahead and answer this question. I was asked by somebody in the last section, they said, why are you all dressed up today? And I, if you know me over the years, I've been probably one of the specialists that dresses down, but well, some one guy had a meeting like this not too long ago. He came up and told me how bad I was looking. And I had lost some weight. I had some issues, but uh, I thought, well, if I, can't, if I don't look good anymore, I may as well try to perk myself up a little bit. So I don't know if this is helping or not. I'm pretty sure this tie will be off by the time the social rolls around. Um, I do appreciate you asking me up again. You know, even if I'm not asked to speak, I, I do try to come here because it's such a good conference. And, um, you know, my drive ups hadn't always been the greatest. You know, today I fought traffic in Norfolk, Virginia Beach. I live in Suffolk, Virginia, southeast Virginia on the west side of Norfolk, and it, traffic was awful this morning, so it took me a little longer to get here. But, you know, I, I hit the shore, got across the Bay Bridge Tunnel, and hit the shore, and I thought I'm home free now, you know, and down the road. And I had my cruise set, I was going right at about 60, 61 miles per hour, and then I saw blue lights in the back. I said, oh man, what do they do now? Fortunately, I had a tail light was out, or turn signal, or probably just tail light. And I said, well, you know, after, let's see, 15 years, 300,000 miles, I finally got rid of my red Ford pickup, okay? Bought me a new truck last week, I said, well, I just bought this truck last month, so he let me off. I, I don't know, he didn't even give me a warning. He said, well, I'll let you go, but you need to get that fixed. Not as bad as one other time that I came to this meeting. I um, was coming across the Bay Bridge Tunnel. Again, I always set my cruise because I don't always judge how fast I'm going very well. So driving along the Bay Bridge, you know, towards the end of it, Blue lights in the, in the back. I thought, oh man, no, wait a minute. I just saw him in the back of me. He didn't have the blue lights on. He followed me a while. I thought, what is this guy following me for this time? And all of a sudden, this seagull jumped out in front of me and I hit it and it went flying over the top of the truck and looked back and it hit that, that policeman right in the square of that windshield. Well, he slowed down. I thought, well, at least he's out of my hair today. And all of a sudden, Got off the bridge and here he comes, blue lights flaring, and uh, pulled me. You know he gave me a ticket for that. You believe that? What for? Flipping him the bird. <laughs> I was at this meeting one time. I got my lowest ratings ever. I don't think I was feeling very good, so I didn't tell any jokes. So this time I brought my joke book with me. If I get boring today. I've got a whole book of jokes, just like a hundred pages of things. And just tell me, hey man, you're boring us, so we'll, uh, why don't you tell some jokes? Anyway, I just read them off today. I got plenty of them. That was put together by Jonah Bowles, who was, who, he's retired now, but Farm Bureau, he worked for Farm Bureau and wrote a weekly newsletter, and he always started out that with a joke. And I think uh, it says, when nothing else works, laugh. So anyway, we'll try to have a little fun today. Um, position, Grow, Protect, that's the title of my presentation. I think in your guide you've got the subtitle of that. I want to recognize these other people involved. I think it was 2004, January 2014, me and, a few, and most of these folks right here, minus these two, got together at University of Maryland. We just said, hey, we need to work together on some type of research or an extension project. What should we work on? And we, it was decided, well, what we have in common is our double crop system. You know, very few people have that. I mean, let's face it, that's been our bread and butter as far as soybean production goes and, and small grain production in this area. We've got that advantage. We can produce two crops in one year. So we started talking, got some funding, started a three-year, five-state research project that we finished up in 2017, and we've gotten all the data analyzed now, and I'm gonna share some of that with you now. And most of that's gonna focus on this position part of my presentation, so I'm gonna spend a lot more time on that than I will to grow and protect. But let's move forward with this. This is my philosophy as far as, I guess, agronomy, agriculture grows. I think we will come into our own once we keep the fields green in the wintertime. 
This quote is being used by NRCS, other people. This was over 100 years ago by Georgia agronomist, scientist, I think. And this is an old quote. It took us a long time to get there. And we're, we're, we're getting there with cover crops and so forth. And I, I'm all for cover crops. Do not get me wrong when I, when, about what I'm getting ready to say about cover crops. But I'm all for cover crops. And I'd like to see them planted any acre we have just because of this reason, because I think that's going to take us to that next highest yield, yield and sustainability level. But cover crops don't feed the world, at least from the standpoint of we normally think of cover crops. Now, first of all, if we're grazing those cover crops, making hay out of them, doing something like that, integrating animals on the system, hey, I'm all for it. Then we'll plant soybeans because that's what we do in many of these cases. Make haylage out of it or whatever we want to do. So I'm all for that. But a few years ago when the programs got so enticing and small grain prices went down that farmers were telling me, David, why should I even grow small grains? Because at least I can get a cover crop payment and break even on some of this. Well, are we really accomplishing our big goal? Are we really accomplishing? Everybody here needs to be thinking about that. We need to preserve the environment while feeding the world. And that's when I, that's kind of been my philosophy all along is double cropping systems is probably one of the most environmentally sustainable and productive systems we have. Therefore, we should focus on it. This doesn't include 2017 nor 2018 data, but you know, there's mid-Atlantic soybean acres total. Uh, these are, I'm sorry, these are hectares, so divide this, I mean, mul multiply that by two and a half, you'll get total acres, but uh, here's the double crop acres. In general, we've been fairly steady at 40%. In Virginia, we were down to less than 25% last year. So I don't, again, I, I get concerned about that. Um, don't really have that higher wheat prices, but soybean prices are really bad now, so they're more in line anyway. You know, I don't know that you can justify just growing full season soybean for that reason, but their environment, I mean, I think the whole system, regardless of whether it's small grain and soybean or two other crops, it's an environmentally sound, it helps feed the world. We're getting production efficiency by this. And I'm talking about equipment as well as fertilizer and lime on this. Higher quality grain for soy, at least soybean quality, is much better double crop. I mean, if we're growing for seed, yeah, most of our seed producers will be double cropping that seed. Um, we just don't have the seed quality issues we have in full season bean. And greater income on general. On average, I think there's greater income, better cash flow, that type of thing. So, again, that's my soapbox spill about double cropping so you can see how passionate I am about it. But keep in mind, we cannot or should not treat these double crop beans like full season beans. If we do that, it's not going to work as well for us. Now the big issue we've had later is declining income. Uh, unfortunately with bean prices that continues that trend. But uh, I really think since we've got lower bean prices, especially relative to wheat, we'll probably see our double crop acres go back up, at least in the next few years. Another caveat is yield is king. I could talk about all the days about way to save money on double crop systems and the profitability of it and all this, but let's face it, yield is king. There's at least a perception that our full season yields is increasing faster than the double crop yields. Maybe some truth into that, especially at the high yield levels. But I have seen 80 some bushel double crop beans after barley under irrigation. And I've grown, in small plots, I've grown up to 90 bushels. So the potential is there. We just need to work on getting it there. I'm going to focus on soybean in this talk. I'm going to show some wheat data from our experiments, but I'm going to focus on soybean. Keep in mind our intensively managed wheat production system that's been so successful of a, with us continues to work. Whatever you do, don't, don't do anything that's going to hurt that wheat crop, in my opinion, because that, I think that's a big part of it. All right, let me start to get into 
my thrust of my presentation. Uh, this is a graph minus a few th w with a few things added that Jim Dunphy, my counterpart at NC State, showed me, I guess, going on 23 years ago. That's when I started at Virginia. He said, this is, we're talking about planting date. He said, this graph will explain everything about planting date you need to know. Maximum yield potential, 100%. That's not 100 bushel. We definitely weren't at that level 20 years ago, even in yield contest fields. Earlier, later, that's what our yield does, and that's really what it does. I think he's still right about that. I don't know when this planting date is when this yield really drops down, but basically we can say this is double crop, and this is full season, more or less. Now this date moves around from, oh, I've seen it as early as mid-May, as late as mid-July. I really have because we don't really know what that date is going to be. It's hard to predict, but generally about mid-June in Virginia, maybe early June as we can move farther north, later June as we move farther south. The reason for this is we got, we got less sunlight intercepted, and I'm going to get into details on that, but let's not forget about we are getting a small yield decrease just with planting date. This could be full season beans, but I don't think it's real significant or it's not very um, applicable in most of our situations. But the idea is you plant earlier, you move the reproductive, key reproductive stages of soybean, which are, of course, to pod and seed development into the longer days of the year. Longer days of the year, capture more sunlight. Maybe you're avoiding a drought like they do in the Delta states because they always have a drought in August almost always, so they're going to an early soybean production system, not only early planting date, but early maturing varieties. They avoid that drought, and then they harvest, you know, early September. But that's not the main thing here. The main thing here is this light that you're getting. This may or may not occur, because of course water is the main, main most important thing to all of crop growth, regardless of the species or crop. And if we don't get that moisture during that seed fill and, and pod fill time, we're, whether we, we get capture more light or not is not important. But I am going to focus a lot on light and soybean. Because in most cases, because soybean is somewhat, I wouldn't call it drought resistant, but we, it does, you know, it's hard to justify irrigating just soybean because, hey, soybean, compensates. If we don't get rain early, get rain later, it compensates and vice versa. But light is very important. Now the problem here is not only do we have shorter days, that's part of this problem. The other thing is we don't have enough growth. We're not growing enough leaves. That's what this means, leaf area index. If I can get a leaf area index of 4.0, that means I've got four acres of leaves per acre of ground. I don't need any more. I'm capturing 95% of the sunlight. Double crop, in many cases, we're not doing that. So we're already at a deficit regardless of when it rains. So I want to focus on, this is really where this, most of this presentation comes from. But over my, my experience and research and everything else shows that this is probably three quarters of double crop production, at least three quarters. It's grown enough plant there to make sure we can capture all the sunlight to produce the yield. I want this, I don't want this. Whether it's wide rows or just, this is actually the same field, believe it or not. Same date, took a picture on the same date. Double crop soybean after wheat. Really deep sand, David Hula type soil right there. It's a loam, it's a Wickham loam in Virginia. Uh, about six foot of loam on top of sand. Great soil. I'm not talking sandy loam, I'm not talking clay loam, I'm talking loam. Um, so if, you, if I could do this every year, with this is right at flowering. These plants are flowering. If I could do that every year, I wouldn't be talking to you about this. I just can't always do it. So, um, position, grow, protect. If you don't remember anything else I say, remember these three words. Position, number one. Two, grow, three, protect. And it really needs to be in that order, okay? 
forget everything else I, I say today or you need a refresher, just give me a call. And we'll discuss each of this in more detail. I can talk to you all day about it, even though you probably don't want to. Um, position the soybean for a longer growing season, grow more leaves, and protect the valuable leaf area. I'm going to focus probably over half of my presentation to be about positioning the soybean for a longer growing season. But the reason I'm doing this is I want to grow more leaves. When I get into the grow part, I'm talking about certain techniques that we can use to grow more leaves. Long ago, when we started talking about what can we do to get our double crop yields up, and we had, we had a farmer meeting. We had over 20 farmers from five states we brought in, and they gave their ideas. And at the end of the day, we kicked around all these good ideas, and it came back to planting date. It really came back to planting date. We got to have that longer growing season. We could do our most good if we focused in on that. So I'm going to show you some of our research from that, from that experiment. And I'm going to focus first of all on that. Okay, how do we position a growing soy, double crop soybean for a longer growing season? Can everybody read that? Grow barley. If we can get in there two weeks earlier, or one week earlier, I'm gaining about a half a bushel a day. Now, if we can only get a good market for barley, we've tried all kinds of markets in Virginia. We even tried burning it, making ethanol. That didn't work out. You got a good opportunity here in Delaware. You got some a malting barley facility. I visited that last week. To me, that is a great opportunity. You can get a good price for barley if the quality will hold up on it and you grow the right variety and so forth, and then get your beans planted you know, 10 days earlier maybe, that's five bushel of soybean. So it's a good thing, but I just don't have that market for barley. I was always told the reason they grow used barley out in uh, Canada, western states, is the quality is so much better for making beer, but maybe we can do it here. And I think it's a real opportunity. Plant an early maturing wheat variety early. Yeah, I got early in there twice. This is what I mean by this. I just want to throw an idea out that we're researching right now. And basically what we're doing, and by, before I get into that, roughly, and it, this depends on the price of wheat and soybean, but I can generally sacrifice one bushel of wheat uh, for every day of harvest. Every day I can harvest earlier, okay? So if I can harvest earlier, I can lose a bushel of wheat, and that's based on one bushel of wheat is about equivalent to a half bushel of beans. Now, although I've said let's not do anything to hurt the wheat crop, uh, I'm looking at this. Our early maturing varieties, at least in Virginia, don't yield as well as the later ones, so that never worked out. So what we've done, we've started an experiment oh, a few years ago. Carl Griffey, our plant breeder, Wade Thomas, and our grain specialist, and I, and some students, thought, what if we plant wheat in September? What if we plant wheat in early October? What if versus mid-October, you know, mid-October to the first of November, depending on where we are in Virginia, is our optimal planting date in Virginia for wheat. What happens if we grow that earlier and integrate that with early maturing variety? If I can gain, you know, anywhere between three and five days, I've increased my soybean yield quite a bit, and, and it starts to look good. Our September planting date just hasn't not worked out for us in Virginia regardless of the variety. However, that early October is, there shows some promise. But you've got to be very careful about which variety you choose. And we're only gaining two or three days, but then again, if I can gain three days, bushel and a half of soybean, which isn't worth much anymore, but, uh, you know, we're, we're gaining something. It's a little bit we can gain. If that economically is better, that's what we need to move to. But we're not there yet. So I'm not going to focus on this, but you get the idea. Whatever we can do to get those bean yields up are great. All right, this is our idea. It really isn't our idea. It came from the farmers. They said, let's harvest some wheat at 20% moisture. Has anybody here ever harvested 20% moisture wheat? You love it. You love it, great. My question is. We do it for quality. Do it for quality. That's when you. When you, as soon as you, have you ever stuck your hand in that bin right after you harvested 20% moisture wheat? I've, I've, I've had to stop and take it out of gear and take a dough ball out of top of the auger. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it warms up, don't it? So before we go any further, I do recognize that this wheat will, will heat up quickly. Okay. We, we've actually taken it to the elevator and opened up the door in the bottom of the truck. And it come up. You got a three, <laughs> three foot square hole and nothing come out. Yeah. It takes up to get, get it flowing. Yeah, but so, but if you can dry it quickly, and that's a key. We'll have 64, 65 pounds this week. Okay, did you hear that? If you can do it from experience from a farmer, your 64, 65 pound test weight, that's really good. And look, in the prior but, okay, I don't need to talk anymore. All right, there you go. I'll just let him come up and Maybe tell you his get experience. Your beans in five, six days earlier. Get your beans in five, six. What, where are you from? Smyrna, just up the road. Just up the road. So, this is what we researched, so you already heard it. Uh, we don't need, I can skip through all this. We'll talk about something else. But this is what we started doing. What we did, we did five states, but we learned something from it because each state's a little different. And I'll try to show you some differences we have. And years were different, but not as much as this that north-south range. Um, five states, three years. We had over 20 site years of data. So it's a very robust data set. Multiple environments, multiple soil types. So we learned a lot about harvesting at 20%. We went in, the earliest we went in, we tried to hit 20%, and then we did five more harvest, spaced four to seven days apart. Now that was our goal. Now if it set in and started raining, which we had that issue a few times, we really spread that harvest out. So, you know, we didn't, nothing ever works goes as you plan it but we got a nice set of data and that's what I want to show you let's talk about the wheat data first okay uh, this is just an example these are small plots because we had multiple soybean varieties we had multiple wheat harvest date and soybean but you know we're taking up a few acres here just on these small plots not that small of a plot but let's talk about our wheat results first all right, I want to go by state on this because this is something we did clearly see differences between the states, and this was this yield response to wheat. Maryland. I'm on, Pennsylvania, we saw no yield response. Now, that's over to three years, about three site years, but we saw no yield. It basically was flat, and we planted much later than Maryland, which you'll see some test weight data shortly. But we saw no yield response in Pennsylvania. Maryland, you know, this is June 1. This is the number of day of the year, 150 to 200. So you've got a 50-day period from here to here. June 1 to July 1. So now we're getting into July. We didn't start seeing our wheat yield drop until July. So really, we're not hurting ourselves unless something really delays you late. Delaware, we shifted that date slightly to an earlier date. The Maryland data included uh, Beltsville as well as the Y Farm on the shore, so we got a mixture of data there. Delaware, you know, a little warmer environment, but we are shifting this date when wheat falls late. Notice it's not a big, gra it's a fairly gradual decline in yield though. Virginia, going further south now, now we've really shifted that date right into the heart of when we almost always harvest wheat, you know, mid to late June. And look how fast our yield goes down. Now we had some really late harvest here, so we had some very poor yields, and this was due to, I don't know, we had rain or something that, that year. But this is all, you know, three years, multiple sites combined together. So you're missing some of the details, but notice how this date is shifting as we go south. And then in North Carolina, even from the 1st of June, we start getting a wheat yield loss. I think this has some, a lot to do with the environment, climate, and so forth. So. Pennsylvania, or Virginia's always had higher average wheat yields than North Carolina, and I imagine Delaware and Maryland are similar. Is that the reason? Because we're losing yield much quicker in wheat. Why are we doing that? I think most of this is a header loss. You get into a warmer north, you know, eastern North Carolina, southeast Virginia environment, it dries down quick, so, and then you get this fluctuation up and down. So maybe that's it, so, but we do see this as we go from north to south more important as you go south. Let's look at test weight. Pennsylvania, I'll show that data. And see, they, they didn't get their uh, wheat harvested, at least in our test plots, until later in the year. But immediate drop in test weight, that's what you're getting at. 
Uh, immediate drop in test weight, Maryland. Immediate drop in test weight, Delaware. It's getting a little steeper. Further south we get, and nah, that's not about quite bad, but immediate drop in test weight in Virginia. Immediate drop in North Carolina. Again, we're harvesting June 1. We are, I think we harvested late May a couple of years just because our wheat was so early in a couple of sites. So uh, the test weight is clear. The test weight is clear. We did do some Don readings. We didn't see a lot of differences in Don. It was just toe up and down, you know, as far as the, the uh, mycotoxin goes. <coughs> now, I don't know if this includes all of our grain falling numbers. This is just an example of what the falling numbers did. You know, um, we're, we're not making bread out of most of our soft red, but anyway, it serves the purpose. Um, depending on the state, depending on year, whether or not the falling number really decline. And of course that's rainfall events as well as tests. It's the number of events. So really that's controlling this probably more so than the actual date. All right, let's go to soybean data. Any questions about the wheat data? I just want to show you. There's some trends there. You know, higher test weight is, we all thought we'd get that, but you know, this yield trend is something I didn't really expect, especially in North Carolina and Virginia that we really got that drop in wheat yields. Um, Okay, let's go look at the soybean data. This is a little easier. There's all the data, 20 some site years. Does the curve look familiar? That's what I showed you earlier. I haven't learned a thing in 20 years, have I? I got a date on it though, that's good. It's mid to late June. This, this is our kind of a unknown area, this little gap right here. So yeah, when we normally start harvesting wheat, we're almost getting a, a yield loss in soybean. Then it really gets dramatic later in July, June and into July. But, and hopefully we're trying not to harvest in July, but we're there. But, you know, there's a little bit of a plateau here, at least for North Carolina and Virginia, where we were able to get in late May, early June. I've always said if I can get my beans planted by the second week of June, I don't get a yield loss. That's probably not completely true, but that's generally what I've seen. Barley yields are sometimes might be on average higher than our May planted beans. All right, this is the reason. We did not collect leaf area index readings. It's just too hard to collect. We did get, use a green seeker though on these plots, collected NDVI. One thing we have found that an NDVI of 0.85 to 9 is equivalent to a leaf area index of 4. Roughly, and there's some play in that. But in other words, I get my four acres of leaves to capture 95% of my sunlight to make my best yield. At least I'm not light limiting. If I can get an NDVI of 0.85 to 9, and I want it by the time we're flowering, starting to produce the first pod. That's been what I've been saying for years. Uh, we found out something a little different, but without going through a lot of detail, the earlier plantings had more leaf area, okay? No big enlightenment there. But what really matters is how long we keep that leaf area as well during this reproductive stage. Now that was something that we thought was ready, that's true, but we really didn't have enough data to say that. We now do, because what I did, we took the area under these curves. I mean, we just took that area, and we're talking three or at least two dimensional here, not just when that got to our maximum NDVI. See, here's some later planting dates. They were looking pretty good, you know, at flowering, but they just never really got to where we need them to go. Once we get up here, excess leaf area, you might call it, later in the year, you take that. Then we graph that, the area under season-long NDVI dynamics. In other words, total amount of leaf area we've had over that entire growing season, relative yield, there's almost a perfect relationship. So that explains over three quarters of the variability in double crop soybean production. That's why I'll go back and say, if we can grow the leaves, we've solved 75% of the problem. And we can tweak it after that, but unless you do this up front, all the little things I'll mention, the rest of this talk, do not matter. So, I'm going to take you to individual states. Let's go to Pennsylvania. Now, here I've got relative maturities. We planted three relative maturity groups, if you want to call them that. 
Pennsylvania, these were early threes, mid threes, late threes, okay? We just groups. In North Carolina, we were looking at a late four and, and fives, okay? Because that's what fits that environment. We weren't going to plant a three in North Carolina nor a five in Maryland. That just wouldn't have worked. But we always had these three groups. So this is what you see. You've got the early maturity groups, and that's the yield response we generally got. A little bit of a plateau, no yield loss, but then it comes down. No differences in relative maturity between an early three and a late three. Maryland, we did see differences in relative maturity. In this case, this is our rain fed, Maryland rain fed, but it's two locations here over, over three years. But here, the later maturity groups do better than the early. Well, why? Because of not only did we reach that critical leaf area early, we maintained it for longer in the year. So later maturity do, group did well. Delaware, no differences, and there's our responses. Uh, North, there's Delaware irrigated. Now, I can't really explain. Let me see. I got a little bit of a no yield loss area up here with rain fed. I don't have it with irrigated. But we got a lot more variability in the irrigated data, so maybe it's just that we're not picking it up. But anyway, I'm not going to say anything more about it because I can't explain it. Rain fed in Virginia, we got a much wider uh, area right here. We've got a longer growing season, more the opportunity to grow more leaves. So you don't get, not only do you not get a steeper, steep decline, you've got more of a plateau where you have no yield loss. Uh, North Carolina, interesting thing about North Carolina, we, we were seeing that yield loss from the very beginning. I cannot explain it, but the other thing, this was in northeast North Carolina, very high production area, you know, 60 bushel beans is the norm getting into a mineral organic soil, but most of this data was conducted on just regular coastal plain deep sand. Now, we had some of the best growing seasons we ever had in this area. Maybe the sand was an advantage. So, I don't know why our late fours are out yielding the fives, but that is not atypical for that area. So anyway, but, you know, as you move through this, you don't see that drastic decline that we see in the Delmarva area in southeast Virginia or North Carolina. It's a more gradual decline. So we're probably not losing a half a bushel, but Delaware, Maryland, those areas probably losing more to late planting date. So harvest wheat, 20% moisture. Um, I really think it's time we start promoting this more. Either we look at the cost, and I've got to do this, look at the cost of drying, see if it works out, see if we need on-farm on dryers, or see if we can get our buyers to take higher moisture wheat. They're going to get a better quality on average. And I really believe that about falling number and everything. I mean, if you harvest earlier, there's less chance of a rainfall event taking that down. Test weight's clearly better on all this data. The problem with that is, for the average farmer going to a mill, if he takes in 20% wheat, he <laughs> gets out 53, 54 Right. So he gets docked too. Right. Docked you're going to get docked dock for drying costs, and you're going to get docked for where nobody's going to pay you for water. And you can't, you it's can't never, sell so that's a problem, but we actually do have a buyer in Virginia, it's a small area, that is buying grains. They want food quality wheat, okay? They want to mill that for cookies, crackers, and so forth. They're not docking. 18 is a lot better than 20. 18 is a lot better than 20, but you know, by the time, what my experience is, by the time you hit 20%, by the time you get most of it in, it's at 18. So, I mean, this, at least, in my area, it dried down quick. But you got an awful hot bin load of wheat, so you got to do something with it immediately. But we need to start thinking about this, at least not waiting to 13% moisture. What Purdue was buying at 15%, you know, about the second year into this study because I was in North Carolina, and the farmer asked what we were getting. We were getting about 17, 18. He called Purdue, oh yeah, we'll take it 15%, no dockage. Not gonna pay you for the water. So he started harvesting the rest of the field. He was running 16%, and he was glad he did. What, what, so. it, what it does for the guy that got uh, a large number of acre of wheat, and they have a grain dryer, they can start, they can be 18, 
okay. Point was if yeah, the point was if you got a large acreage of wheat and a grain dryer, you can start earlier and it'll eventually start drying down. So anyway, the economics of that needs you know, talking to eighteen to twenty percent, that's kind of tough, but I think fifteen percent is very doable. We need to really think about this more. Okay? And maybe move towards this. Choose a late maturing soybean variety. I'm gonna move through this fast, but long story short. If you look at all the data, the later maturing varieties, the fives build more leaf area than threes. So um, even within, even though I didn't show differences between those individual sites, we were seeing differences in in some of the readings here. So um, again, you got a longer growing season. So I'm gonna stick with my recommendation of plant the latest maturing variety that will mature before, your, before being frosted, before frost. That's always been my recommendation for double crop. I'm gonna stick with it. The exception is if you're on a soil type like this, you got a, you know, you got a more productive soil, you don't, probably don't need that later maturing variety just because that soil will grow an early maturing variety better and earlier you got the leaf. So it does make sense. There's an explanation to why under better soil type we can go with the early maturing variety and my experience is the early maturing varieties might have more yield potential. At least you know, when I'm comparing fours and fives. Uh, stripper header to speed up wheat harvest, plant soybean immediately after wheat. I think you already know this, but I like a stripper, stripper header not only because it, you, know, you can get in and out of the field quicker, but it's easier to plant soybean. I'd much rather have things standing up than on the ground. Uh, okay, number two. I don't have much time left, do I? How much time I got left? Got, uh, 13 minutes. I only got 13 minutes left, and, and that's, but I wanted to focus on this. If you accomplish this, then we can start focusing on growing more leaves. Let me just throw some pointers out that I, uh, I think will, will be of some value. First of all, fertilize for both crops. And if you're baling straw, keep, make note that there's quite a bit of nutrients in, those, in that straw, okay? I won't go into a lot of detail on that. We've done some potassium work and how this straw really brings a lot of potassium that is leached in our sands back to the top. And I think there's value in that. Not only just recycling potassium, and we could probably use less potassium based on a soil test, but won't get into that today. Now, the straw's not all good though even though it may redeposit these mined nutrients, <clears throat> again, it's acting as a cover crop. And I, I can't see where a cover crop we terminate in April or May is doing any more of this than one we're letting grow all the way to June. Again, I, all right, I'll get back off my soapbox with double cropping versus just cover crops. We can tie up certain nutrients, and I'm mainly thinking about nitrogen here. Um, so we did some work. I asked, several years ago, we uh, injected UAN between the rows, 15 inch rows. We injected it because we didn't want to lose any of it. Um, but we put some nitrogen on the crop. Um, my thought was it wouldn't do anything, um, but we tried it. In the end, and we used multiple rates, I'll show you this data. We ended up with seven different locations over a couple of years. This is soybean yield, nitrogen rate, and you can see this is pretty much flat. The response to yield is pretty much flat, but we did gain 1.1 bushel on average over every site. We saw it everywhere we went. Um, so that is happening. We are tying up a little bit of nitrogen. Is this profitable to put nitrogen? No. I don't see by the time you look at the cost of nitrogen and application costs, it's going to benefit from doing this. But it's, there it is for what it's worth. So I think we are tying up some nutrients. If we can somehow give that plant a boost or something. Now, I, I put it between the rows. I didn't look at sulfur. I didn't look with phosphorus. And I didn't do a two by two band or something. And I've always, I'll have a planter that I can do that with in the future, but I want to look into that. 
Double crop variety, we, do, we, we conduct double crop and full season tests, and we do see differences in how those varieties rank. Some varieties are better double crop than full season and vice versa. Most of them are not. You get a good variety, it's a good variety. Grow more leaves, one way you can do that is control our weeds. I'd like to see everybody go in three weeks after planting and spray their weeds. Roundup ready, we got away from that, and I think we were losing a lot of yield. Double crop, I'm saying two weeks. I think you need to be in a week earlier than what you feel like you need to be in on double crop because those weeds are competing earlier, they're growing faster, and it's going to hurt your double crop soybean much more than your full season. If you're irrigating, don't wait until flowering. I'm going to take a little bit of time and explain my philosophy on this, and I think I've got some data to show that. When soybean, I've noticed this over and over, soybean and double crop, they come up, come up really well, then they just sit there a couple of weeks or more. They don't grow. Everybody was saying, oh, that's wheat toxicity, uh, you know, something leaching out of the wheat. So I did the work with wheat, fallow, rye, barley, <coughs> treated them as cover crops, killed them at a different time and took it to harvest. I saw no differences in that. I think what's happening here, though, is it's a water issue. You start out with a full moisture, soil full of moisture, a full profile of moisture. You know, when the wheat's small and then the wheat gradually sucks this out, it doesn't really do it like this, but just think of it perceptually. By the time wheat is ready to harvest, sometimes we're almost at zero, or by the time the wheat starts drying down, then we'll get some rains, replenish that. Soybean come up, grow well, and we just don't have enough moisture for it to keep on growing. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I can't breathe it. I can't prove it, but I think that's what's happening. That's why I say, and monitor your soil moisture. If you're lacking in moisture, I think we're going to slow this bean crop down early on. And we don't want to do that in double crop. Full season don't matter. Excellent work out of Delaware. Corey and others has done good work on that. Shows that. You know, irrigation really doesn't matter until we're producing seed and pod, but I really do think this is important under those years in which we're a little drought stressed. Variety selection, narrow row, higher seed and rate, uniform seed space, and I mean within the row. This matters in double crop. We've got data to show that, okay? In double crop, can't say it all the time in full season, but in double crop, that uniform seed, another controlled spills with a drill is just not the way to go, folks. Um, if you're interested in some variable rate seeding, see me after this. I want to start some uh, large field studies on that. Protect this valuable leaf area real quick. I'm not protecting it necessarily from weeds. That's part of growing the crop. But you know, some of these burning herbicides, I, and we, Henry Wilson and I years ago did some work, gosh, it's been 10 or 15 years ago, looking at these, you know, blazer, cobra, some of these burning herbicides, maybe something that injures the crop. That does hurt our yield a little bit, not much, but it only hurts it in double crop and only what's been planted later. Where we got a leaf area deficit is where we're being hurt there. Defoliators, pod feeders, we all have to worry about this. However, if we're later in the year growing soybeans, in general, we're going to have more pods feeders. Defoliators, first of all, generally, I don't get over, overly concerned about defoliators and soybeans especially early on. We can tolerate a lot of defoliation. Just don't go spraying these guys with the pyrethroid. But in double crop, it matters more. I cannot tolerate 30% defoliation in double crop for reasons I've stated before. It's more like 10 to 15% at the most. And then once I get into pod development, it's probably down to 5% or so. I just can't tolerate it. But don't go spraying everything with a pyrethroid or you end up with this guy, that's soybean looper that does this to your crop very quickly. We've occasionally had this in Virginia to get it in North Carolina quite a bit. So that's a problem. Foliar diseases, if you don't have much leaf area and you got good airflow, you're gonna have less disease, okay? And I've seen that over and over and over again. But if you're doing your job of positioning that crop for a long season, then growing that crop where you got maximum leaf area, I think diseases are worse than a double crop. And I've got data to kind of show that if I've got, but it's only if I've got a good canopy, but the inoculant's got to be higher. Because we've got a whole full season crop that's been churning out this disease inoculant. Now that's going to go to our double crop. Consider tram lines. We've shown between a 1 and 4% loss depending on the width of the sprayer and whether or not this is in 15 or 
or seven and a half inch rows of yield loss by running over beans. Especially when we're putting on fungicide and insecticide, we're injuring our beans. So consider tram lines, even though we got guidance systems, some people say we don't need them anymore, I say we do. Again, once we position our crop and grow it, if we got a good enough crop out there to treat it with a fungicide or insecticide, then we don't want to do a lot of damage. Nematodes, we are starving these guys for another two to four weeks, so that's good, right? My experience is they do more damage on the double crop, though, just because we don't have the robust growth. So, you know, you got nematodes, maybe double crops are not your best option. Okay, position, grow, and protect. Again, that's your take home message. Be happy to talk to anyone more about this or anything we can do to get the soybean to the next level. I think we beat this to death, okay? Maybe we can start growing high moisture wheat or harvesting high moisture wheat, but then now I think we need to focus on these things and see where we can go from there. I want to thank especially now, we've had a lot of people involved with this project, seed companies, crop protection companies, and I can't list them all here, but I do want to thank our growers. This was largely funded by checkoff dollars. So our growers did fund almost, well they funded probably 90% of this work. Okay, probably out of time. But we can continue to talk at the social, or how much time do we have? We have three more minutes. We got three minutes, so one or two quick questions or comments. I'll take either one. Yes, sir. On your yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. On our nitrogen application work, we did it right at planting. I should have specified that. Our idea with the wheat residue was tying up the nitrogen, so we wanted to do it. I've done work. A lot of others have done work with, uh, you know, the flowering stage application. I could never get a consistent response. And I had yield potentials running from 30 to 80. But it's never consistent, consistent now. Good Delaware work coming out of the center pivot, nitrogen and sulfur, that seems to be my, at least it perks my attention. Now is it a nitrogen or a sulfur? Sulfur something, that's the other thing I'd like to do at planting, you know. In a lot of our soils on the coastal plain, at least these sandy soils, you can't find any sulfur in the top, in top soil because it's all subsoil and uh, I think that's a nutrient that maybe soybean needs a little more of earlier, but Again, I, we get responses to wheat, we get responses to corn. I've never seen a response to soybean from sulfur, but I don't know if it's nitrogen or sulfur. I'm getting off track again, but there's some good work that came out of Delaware just in the last few years under irrigation. Okay, anyone else? All right, very good, thank you.